I don't know if you, uh, if you have all your shopping done. There's only a few days left if you don't, um, so you might want to get motivated. Um, but I was, I was uh, this afternoon helping wrap a few of the gifts, and to be honest, I can claim very little credit. My wife does the vast majority of the work, but wrapping is one area where I can add a little bit to the, uh, to the team effort here. And so I was helping wrap a few of the things and, and put some stuff together, and um, boxes kind of stacked up everywhere as you sort of prepare for, for the arrival of Christmas, and the kids are getting excited, they're seeing all this, but it sort of occurred to me, like walking around our house, and there's these boxes um, yet to be opened, all these things that we're sort of waiting for, and, and as I'm walking around looking at, at my house and all the junk that's already like filling the space, and I'm like, where are we going to where are we going to put all this? Like, my kids are going to open up all these gifts, but if I'm walking into their room, I'm not seeing any space for any sort of additional thing. It's kind of the, the American sort of problem. We've, we've got more stuff. The Christmas becomes about getting more a lot of times. I mean, it's, we make lists of things, and, and we do all this stuff, and at the end of the day, we're sort of like, where, where, where do we, where do we, what place does this hold? Where, where do we have a spot for this in, in our lives. Um, I was reminded recently of, um, I was taking a group of students, and this was years ago, um, on, a, on a mission trip down to Mexico. Um, and there's always something about the point in time for me as like a youth pastor when you've got 40 or 50 kids and, and leaders and all these sorts of things, and you're traveling in a big group. But the point in time that you get on a flight and you're pretty, you're at least mostly confident that everyone is there, and, and you're about, like, I can catch my breath for a second. Like, at that point in time, there's a bit of a breather where it's like, okay, for the next five hours on this flight, they're pretty much stuck in one place and can't get into a whole lot of trouble. So I sort of take my seat, and I'm kind of looking forward to this time, ready to sort of catch my breath, maybe take a little bit of a nap. And um, I was, it just so happened that I wasn't seated with any of the students. I was kind of in a different area, um, I don't think that was purposeful on my part, but maybe it was, um, and, and kind of was making myself comfortable when the, the guy sitting next to me kind of struck up a conversation, starts introducing himself and telling me a little bit about himself, and kind of in my mind, if I'm being completely honest, there's, I was sort of looking forward to not a conversation. I was more looking forward to kind of some decompressed time uh, and, and my nap. Um, and so I, I answered his questions. I was polite. I, I, I was maybe not inviting more um, conversations, but he was not picking up on, on my subtle hints. And so he just, he was a talker. He just kept going and asking more questions. He eventually gets to the, the question that um, I think a lot of we get to when we're having sort of surface level conversations. He says, what do you do for a living? I said, actually, I'm a, I'm a youth pastor. I've got a group of students um, back on the flight. We're going down to Mexico and we're working with a ministry partner there. We're going to be serving in the area and, and uh, working with a church. And really, uh, okay. Um, and then at this point in time, I realized I was in for a five-hour conversation. Um, so my nap was off the chart at this point. He started to begin to probe a little bit, and he began to share some about himself and, and, and asking questions about religion and, and philosophy. And he sort of shared how, how he was kind of a, I think he described it as a Jewish agnostic. Um, and so he was describing all his theories on life and, and where we find meeting and, and how you make sense of, of all this stuff. And I kept trying to bring the conversation back to Jesus. What do you do with Jesus? How do you see Jesus? And, and he said he was a great, great teacher, great rabbi, um, a great moral example, a model for, for people to follow. He was, he was a victim of, of a, a Jewish power struggle at the time, and that's kind of how he explained um, the crucifixion. And, and as I was thinking about that conversation and, and replaying that in my head, it was no, he undoubtedly believed in, in Jesus. But as the conversation went on, it was clear that it was a Jesus that lacked some of the, the fundamental truths that we have seen being played out in the Gospel of John over the last few weeks. Truths that really make the person of Jesus and, and the claims of Jesus absolutely unique in all of human history. Truths that are ultimately really essential 
to, to our salvation. I think that this is, this is pretty common in, in our culture. In my experience, and maybe you can relate to this, I have rarely really met anyone or, or seen an example of someone who doesn't believe in Jesus, meaning the historical uh, figure of, of Jesus. I have seen Jesus quoted. I have seen him used as an example or an illustration um, to prove somebody's point. I've even heard Jesus called on in, in prayer, but in so many of those cases, they are referring to this, this limited, this partial version of Jesus, kind of a, a Jesus of, of their own making, sort of picking and choosing the, the parts that they like. And, and there's this sort of overall failure to, to comprehend the fullness of who Jesus is. Which brings us in now to, to the Gospel of John, because these first 14 verses in this Gospel, they're so vital. Because they're not, they're not merely describing Jesus. They're describing the fullness of Jesus. John here is, is providing in a very concise way the essential aspects of our Christology, our understanding of Jesus as, as the evangelical church. John says of this Jesus, he says that he is the Logos, the Word, the central governing principle of our lives and our world, saying that he's more than, than a philosophy to which we ascribe to or attempt to live by. He is a person with whom we can be in relationship with. John says of this Jesus that he is both fully God and, and fully man. He says that he is the incarnate one who took on flesh, who became one of us so that he could redeem us. Jesus, the glory of God revealed to us who dwells among us. Jesus as the one who is the true light, who, who breaks into the darkness, the one who gives light to every man. Jesus, the one in whom we must believe, the one who that we must receive in order to be called children of God. John is building this understanding of Jesus. And you see, without the objective truth of, of the word of God, all we're left with is sort of our subjective preferences and opinions about, about who Jesus is. And historically, um, and you think about it, that, that uh, heresies and, and modern sort of Christian cults all of them deviate on the point of their understanding, their claims of, of who Jesus is. They deviate from what biblical revelation offers to us as, as an understanding about who Jesus is, and, and that's where things go askew. C.S. Lewis said it this way. He says, it's just as dangerous to believe in the wrong Jesus as it is to believe in no Jesus at all. In some ways it's even more dangerous. Because when we, when we call on the name of Jesus, but this partial, limited Jesus of our own making, there, there, there's a lot of danger there. You see, saving faith, the Christian life can certainly involves more than simply believing correct statements about Jesus. But it's not less than that. It, it's not less than that. And I think this is what John has provided to us in his gospel. It's, it's a window, it, it's a picture of the fullness of who Jesus is. As a community, over the last four weeks, we've been a part of a series entitled God Reach Down, really focusing together as the church on, on who Jesus is and how God reached down to us, the body, um, through the incarnation. Let's, let's go once again now to the first chapter. Of, of John's gospel. And we've been focusing on these 14 verses over the last several weeks. But let's hear this again. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. 
He came as a witness, to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. I want tonight, when we talk about the fullness of Jesus, I want us to take a few moments this evening to really focus on, to look at the God who reached down as grace and truth. Here in in verse 14 of John chapter 1, we're reconnected back to that first verse where we're first introduced to Jesus as the Word, the Logos, the eternal Word who was with God who created all that exists and who took on flesh, became one of us and dwelt among us. John here in, in one short verse, he, he articulates, he confronts us with the central truth that is at the heart of the Christian faith. That the God who made the universe took on human skin. That he became one of us and he did it for us and for our salvation. This is the whole meaning of the name Emmanuel, God with us. John, in his description of Jesus here in verse 14, he draws on two really essential components from from the Old Testament. The first is that, that the word that John uses here for dwelt is actually a reference to the Old Testament word for tabernacle. Literally here, John is saying that Jesus tabernacled among us. He took up residence with us. The message version of of the Bible translates this verse and says the word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. This is John's description of Jesus. In the Old Testament, the tabernacle was the place where God's presence dwelt among his people, where they could meet with him. The second Old Testament concept that John draws on here that we find in verse 14 is for the word glory. John connects the dwelling of God with the revealing of the glory of God. John, by connecting the the Old Testament concepts of, of meeting with God and experiencing God, is saying something essential about who Jesus is. Jesus Um, Just as the tabernacle was the place where God manifested his glory among his people, so now we see Jesus is the presence and the glory of God here on earth. Just as the tabernacle was was the center of of the Israelite camp and, and, and worship for the Israelite community, so Jesus is to be the center for us as the church. Just as the tabernacle was the place where where sacrifices were offered and where sin was atoned for, so now Jesus is the perfect and the final sacrifice. Every aspect of the temple, every aspect, it speaks of and points to Jesus, who he is. And and this this is hard for us, but we have to wrap our heads around how extraordinary John's claims are here about Jesus in order to understand the real significance of this verse. When the glory of God is talked about in the Old Testament, it's typically represented in terms of of smoke and and fire and, and brilliant light. These almost unapproachable terms. The Hebrew word for glory in the Old Testament is used over 200 times. And the root meaning of that word carries the meaning of weightiness or heaviness. It it, it conveys the idea that the great significance of the glory of God is the sum of all of his attributes. You see, in the Old Testament, God's glory was overwhelming, incomprehensible, beyond our ability to take in, even dangerous in the Old Testament. 
In Exodus chapter 33 and, and 34, Moses is, is speaking with God, and he asks to request to see God's glory. And God tells Moses that he can't bear the weight. He can't bear the weight of, of seeing God's glory, saying, you cannot see my face and live. Instead, God, God puts Moses in the cleft of a rock, and he covers Moses with his hand, and he's passing by, and, and, and Scripture says he sees the backside of God. It's, it's the place he's, he's seeing like where his glory just was. And that's all Moses can take in. That's, that's, all that he can, that's all that he can handle is this glimpse of God's glory um, as it passes by. Here then is the audacity of what, of what John is claiming about who Jesus is. That this unbearable and, and overwhelming presence, this overwhelming glory in the Old Testament, according to John, the glory of God is now revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. This is what's so incredible about the incarnation, that in Jesus we're not crushed by the, by the glory of God, but rather we are, we are invited to draw in. We're invited into relationship with, we are welcomed as children. That's what John is saying in verse 12 of, of John 1. Um, Timothy Keller uses an illustration to point this out, and we've seen this recently. There were stories a few months ago of different individuals climbing the White House fence and, and running towards the White House and, and towards the president. And, and there was controversy because they weren't stopped um, quickly enough. But if you saw videos of those instances, each and every one of those times, that person was tackled to the ground and apprehended and, and, and taken away um, relatively quickly. Um, they were approaching a, president, uh, a, a, a presence that, that they couldn't be around. But, but if you're one of the president's kids, if you're his daughters, you have unfettered access. You come in um, when you want to. You, 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 you have access into, to the Father at, at, at any time. Um, there's no social or, or, or secret service guard standing at the door ready to tackle the president's daughter when they want to see him. They have access. John is saying that essential point, that through Jesus Christ, we now have access. According to John um, the glory of God has been revealed to us in the person of Jesus Christ, and it says that he dwells among us. John then goes on to establish another component, another aspect of this fullness of, of who Jesus is. This is back in John 1. We're going to pick it up in verse 14 and look at a few verses here. And it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory is of the Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him, and he cried out, This is what he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace, grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The glory of God now is being revealed to us in the person of Jesus Christ. And scripture says that it's full of grace and truth. I want to I pause here for a moment to, to develop this a bit further. Because once again, I believe now John is showing us something. He's giving us something that is really critical about who Jesus is. Again, this whole concept, this reality of the fullness of Jesus and he's showing us something about the nature of God, and he does so by describing him as grace and truth. One of the interesting aspects of this is the word grace here, which is so foundational, so vital in, in the message of the gospel. This word only appears four times in the entire gospel of John. And all four instances are found in in these three verses of John chapter 1. And that strikes me, and I sort of came to that realization that, that struck me as odd, that that word would only be used four times throughout the entire gospel. 
But as I thought about it, I think John's declaration of, of Jesus as the one who is full of grace, perhaps John is saying all that needs to be said. And, and we are hearing all that needs to be understood, that Jesus is the one full of grace. Um, but I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself here for a moment because I first, I want to jump back and I want to talk about this description of Jesus as the one full of, of truth. Because I believe that there is a, a direct correlation between this revelation of Jesus as the one full of truth and what John had said earlier in verse 9 where he says, the true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. The imagery here that, that John is using in this verse carries with it this, this sense of revelation, of, of exposure, the ability to, to see things as they are. John says he is the light. He is the one who is full of truth. And, and if we're honest with each other, this isn't always our favorite aspect or component of, of who Jesus is. Exposure is uncomfortable. It, it can be embarrassing. Um, and the darkness provides cover. It allows us to see the things we, we want to see. Um, later on, again, John uses this imagery a lot. Later on in his gospel, he would say that men love the darkness because, because their deeds are evil. We all know that, that uncomfortable feeling of, of waking up from a deep sleep and, and walking into a bright light. That moment in time where we get up in the morning and you flip the light on the bathroom and, and it just hits you and your face contorts and your eyes squint because you can't really take it all in. I, whenever I'm on retreats with uh, high school students, this is a bit of a confession, but I like to get up in the, in the morning before then just so I can have access to the bathroom and, and take a shower without having people everywhere. And, and, but I'll get them up for breakfast and I always go in there and just start turning on every light in the building and, you know, clapping and singing and shouting. And they're just all like, it's, it's, there's a cruelty to it. I get it. But, um, but it's something that I seem to enjoy for whatever reason. But you can see that expression, right? You, 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 we've all seen it. We all know it. We know that feeling that really is, I think, uh, that physical reaction is a metaphor for, for our spiritual reaction where we recoil, we, we retreat because the light has broken into the darkness and perhaps we're not quite ready to see all that is now being fully revealed. This is an absolutely critical description of who Jesus is, where he confronts us with the truth. I believe this is vital because if we are never, if we don't come face to face with the truth, then we never seek grace. If we fail to grasp the life-sucking damage of, of sin, if we don't take in and recognize our most fundamental needs as human beings, then we don't seek the provision that has been met for that need. If I'm not confronted by, by Jesus as, as the one who is full of truth, then I will never seek him as the one who is full of grace. I, I want to be clear on this point, because I think in my life, I've often thought of this, I've always lived this in my own faith journey, I've looked at this quality of, of who Jesus is as sort of a past tense thing. I think of it in terms of, of salvation, in that moment in time where I understood my need for a Savior, I understood sin, I got it, I was a child, I was, I was nine, but I got it. And, and it was real, and I responded to him, and I prayed to him, and I, I look at this, this quality, this aspect of Jesus as truth, and I'm, I'm thankful for how that happened in my life as, as a small child. But I, all, I think of it in terms of salvation, and I neglect it in terms of sanctification and what work God wants to do in me right now. Um, and to be honest, this is something that God has been processing in me for the last couple of years, making me aware of the fact that I have blind spots in my life and, and slowly revealing to me where those blind spots are at so that you can draw them out and, and take them away. And I'll tell you, it's, it's a bit painful at times. I've had the spiritual reaction 
of, of walking into the light. And, I, and it's not something that I necessarily invited. It's not necessarily that it's something I saw. What God did in me was, was he humbled me. As I, as I began to see blind spots in other people that were around me, almost probably in some sort of judgmental way, and God said, do you really think that you don't have those? If you think that person can't see that, do you really think there's things in you that you're not seeing? So I prayed a very dangerous prayer. And I said, God, show me, show me the blind spots. Show me the things I'm not seeing. There's days I regret praying that prayer in and, and, and my humanness, in all honesty. But God has had me on a truth journey, showing me the things that he's still working on. Again, I told you John loves this, this imagery of light. In, in his epistle in, in the book of 1 John, he says, This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him, while we walk in the darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I love that verse. Because it's in meeting Jesus as the one who is full of truth that ultimately drives us to the Jesus who is also full of grace. Jesus here is not only, he doesn't only give us both. He doesn't just give us truth and give us grace. Scripture says that he is the full measure of both grace and truth. You see, grace and truth are, are the two essential components of our salvation. And they are formed, united in the very character and nature of who Christ is. As I mentioned before in these verses, the book of John, the Gospel of John, only uses the word grace in, in this first chapter. But I think in doing so, he is re profoundly revealing the heart of God. You see, grace is the very reason that God reached down. Grace is the salvation that God offers to a dark and sinful world. Grace is the central message of the gospel. Grace and truth go perfectly together in, in the person of Jesus Christ. When we experience him, we experience God's glory in his presence. We, we can, sometimes we can wish for, some would wish for a, a religion that is all truth. Where, where it's all right and wrong, and it's harsh and, and judgmental and, and self-righteous. And this is what Jesus confronts so often with the Pharisees during his ministry here on earth. And on the other hand, there's times when we want a religion that, that's all grace, all tolerance and acceptance, where, where nobody is, is ever really wrong. But in the gospel, grace and truth collide together in, the, in a way that is unlike anything the world has ever seen or known because grace and truth are perfectly combined in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus did not come to, to explain grace or to teach truth. Jesus came as grace and truth. Charles Spurgeon describes Jesus this way. He says he is truth-filled grace and grace-filled truth. I love that description. Um, oftentimes, this time of year, we refer to the, the book of Isaiah, the prophecies about the, about the coming Messiah, written thousands of years before, before Jesus would be born here on earth. This is from Isaiah chapter 9, but I think, I think we see what John is referring to as as Isaiah looks forward to the arrival of, of the Messiah. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of the deep darkness, on them has a light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy, and they rejoice before you as joy at the harvest, as they are glad that when they divide the spoil. 
For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampling warrior and the battle torment, and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For unto us a child is born. To us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Christmas is, is a time when we ask for, for more. We give, we give lists of the things that we hope to receive. My prayer for, for myself, my prayer for us this Christmas, this Advent, is that we would not settle for a partial Jesus. My prayer this, this Christmas for us as, as First Baptist Church of Geneva is that we would gain more of the fullness of Jesus, that we would know that we would worship Jesus in his fullness, the one who is both full of grace and full of truth. Would you pray with me? Jesus, in you, in you we have everything that we need. So God, I pray that you would continue to show us, that you would continue to reveal to us more of who you are. Or do not let us settle for a limited view of you. But Father, every day show us more of Jesus. And we ask these things in the name of your Son. Amen. Would you stand with me and receive this evening's benediction?